Hello there, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Hodge on Nodge, back by popular demand, actually, this time. I'm not just making that up. Yes, I am back with me today is Juan Arango, and we are going to do kind of what we did in the very last Hodge on Nodge. We're going to talk about a player from South America who's coming into Norwich City. Um, Gabriel Sara was the subject of discussion last time. If you've not checked out that podcast yet, I've had um, people say some really nice things about it. And that's nothing to do with me, by the way. I just ask the questions. It's this man mm. here who has the knowledge bombs that he's going to drop. And uh, Juan is back <laughs> with us to talk about Marcelino Nunez this time. Juan, how good a player is he? Let's just start off um, in terms of where you rate him level-wise and I'm not. I'm going to pass with mm-hmm. the how are you, blah blah blah, because we've yeah. done that. Guys know uh, that you guys and girls that listen to this podcast, they know that you know your stuff. We don't yeah. need any of that preamble. <laughs> Let's just get into it. Marcelino Nunez, tell me about him, man. How good is he? Uh, I'm kind of surprised he's going. Not because he's not quality. It was just that no one. I mean, no one on the outside expected him to be going in this transfer market. Why do I say that? Uh, about well last year you ended up having a player that grew exponentially i mean grew tremendously because that's when he started getting his first call-ups with the chilean national team even if you start looking at many in the chilean press how much he grew after he got called up mind you chile didn't qualify for the world cup but for him it was one of the best things you have two players that ended up and, and and again, every so often, you know, people say, "Why do you criticize this player?" And, and uh, you'll you'll understand what what I'm saying. You had two young players that were emerging. One of them happened to be Robbie Robinson that came mm-hmm. over and and it said, "You know, I want to play for Chile. I want to be part of the national team project. I want to be this. I want to be that." He goes to Chile, and all of a sudden, he's just overwhelmed by the practice sessions. He's overwhelmed by the situation. He's overwhelmed by everything that is going on. Two days after he arrives, he jumps ship, leaves, comes back to the United States, never to be heard of again from the Marcelino Nunez in the in the meantime, ends up getting called up, is one of the players that many were looking at as one of the young, uh one of the young up-and-coming uh players of the future for Chilean football. Now, it sounds like a very high amount of praise, but then again, if you start seeing and delving into him, we can probably delve into that a little bit later. Uh, what goes on in Chilean football right now, uh, maybe that's not the best of compliments, but it is a compliment nonetheless. Now, he took a situation that wasn't very favorable because obviously Chile wasn't very good when it came, when it came to this past World Cup qualifying phase. But he took what was the best what was the situation in of itself and made it very beneficial for him. So much so that when U- U Católica ends up winning their fourth consecutive league title in Chile. He's mm-hmm. interviewed as he was one of the players of the match in that in that very last match of the season. And he says, you know what? Yeah, this has all been great. I, I, I enjoy the ride. But I think next season was going to be my last season at, at, at U Católica. So and he said that. When did he say this? The, the day that they won the title. Right. OK. And how long ago was that? Just for a listeners? That was back in November, December. Of okay. last year. So, so obviously, I mean, we're, we're about on schedule. So, so to, from mm-hmm. a certain extent, no one expected him to leave right now because Un Católica finds itself mired in a lot of trouble. They struggled a great deal in Libertadores. They've, I mean, what makes this team so so different compared to other teams? Forget South America. I mean, even in Europe too, a team that's won four consecutive league titles with four different, actually five different coaches. <laughs> this is the coach now, in merry-go-round that you alluded to. It's not just like Brazil, like in South America. There's well, there's probably yeah, a pattern. Yeah, but but you have you have a team. He's during his time. I mean, mind you, he's been an impactful player for Ucatolica maybe for the last uh, year and a half or two. But having a team that's won four consecutive league titles with actually, I'll say six different coaches because and, and last year being the best year amongst a very atypical year for for Católica where they struggled a great deal. They they started out out of the gate very slow. They were a team that that wasn't able to find their groove. They were a team that find themselves mired it, it, with a coach that ends up coming in and ends up being a bit, you know, Gus Poyet comes in as coach of Católica. 
yes, they do have their best run in Libertadores, but they also have their worst beginning to the league championship. So I don't know, which one would you take? But in spite of all that, he's the player that begins to emerge as one of the main cogs for this. For this, um, well, do you think side. that was justified? Because you know, sometimes when you see players, it's almost like they are. I mean, for want of a better word, their their mm-hmm. brand in terms mm-hmm. of the way scouts view them, in terms of the way fans view them, all of that mm-hmm. is sometimes a bit beyond where they are. Do you think that's the case with him, where it's, it's this sort of encapsulation of he's got so much potential and he's obviously an asset um, mm-hmm. that's got a bit of value for them? So sometimes uh, the press, the club themselves, everyone wants to hype them up. Everyone wants to make them look th- th- this figure that can then be sold on for money and and obviously bump up the price maybe by, by a few euros or whatever currencies used by doing that do you think that's what's happened with them or do you think the praise and the hype is justified i think it's both i think i think i think it's justified what they're saying about him and um i mean you have a player that can play in the midfield you have a player that can play out wide you have a player that can play in the middle you have a player that can that that can be an offensive option up top and of course if you start looking at norris right now and and the pieces that they've been able to acquire, yeah, he's the one that's going to be pulling the strings, or intended to be the player that pulls the strings in the middle and keeps the ball in motion. He did that with with Catolica, so so it, it ends up being a, a very interesting proposition. Bringing in a player that's exciting, bringing a player that's going to be one of those flag bearers for Chilean football going into the future, and uh, more importantly, he's a player that can still be growing. You know, yeah. I mean, you see, you see that he has the potential. You see that he has the flair. You see that he has the technical capabilities. Now, my big thing is that you're going to have much, and, and I don't know if I can put the word "much" in this sentence enough, but much, 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 much less time on the ball compared to the championship or even yeah. the Premier League. Or you have he has he has had, and this is just based on me. This is not someone he's going to have much less time to make decisions he's going to have to speed up his game significantly to be a, a an impact player i don't even talk about immediately i'm talking about in, in the short term or later on in the season or going into next season his game is going to have to speed up or he's going to have to slow down the game itself in order for him to be successful now that does that mean that he's not going to be successful no it just means that the speed of the game is going to have to increase for him in order for him to be able to make decisions better he does usually make the best decision possible but he's going to have to do it in a smaller frame of time what would you say are his hallmarks as a player what what stands out when you watch him play i and as many norwich fans will have done have obviously done the dig about on YouTube, look mm-hmm. at some highlights. Mm-hmm. And that can sometimes be deceptive in terms of players can look really good on YouTube and then uh, fail the eye test in 90 minutes quite comprehensively. Mm-hmm. Obviously, players have good games and bad games, but you, if you watch them over a concerted period of time, certain players will, will excel in terms of the short YouTube clips, and that will be the best way to showcase their ability. Whereas other players, you're better watching them for 90 minutes to get an impression of what they can do. Yeah. What's he yeah. like as a 90 minute player? Is he a guy that sort of comes in and out of games and when he does impact it, he makes a significant impact on it? Or is he someone that runs things, tempo, dictates it, all of that stuff? I think it's the more of the latter. I mean, if you're talking about a music 20, to my ears, bro. If if you have a 20, you have a 19, 20, 21 year old, he's gonna be fade in and out. So so that that's that's normal. You know, if if he if he were if you were a player that was that was plugged in the entire 90 minutes, which he has the potential to, and he, he'll get to that phase. And, and I think he wasn't plugged in not because he wasn't capable of doing. It's just because of the league he plays in. You know, I'll be completely honest with you. If you start looking at Chilean football, it, it's near the middle towards the bottom of South American football in terms of quality as of right now. Because of you, the economic, you obviously know English football as well, man. Just to give our listeners a gauge, how would you say it compares quality wise? Maybe sort of middle of League One, I, I would say, uh, type of standard. So, so maybe mm. a tier below the Championship kind of level is where where I would pitch it at. 
but you watch a lot more of it than me, and you've probably got a better gauge in calibrating that. And just just yeah. in, in terms of yeah. the point you're um, making, while you think about that, it's worth pointing out as well that, that yeah. for a young player like that, I think a move is important to, to, to pull them up a level and for their game to continue to progress. That's yeah. probably why this is a good fit. Uh, I, I I think yeah I I, th- I think it, it's it I mean if you look at it if if he were a team he'd be one of those teams that hasn't been at or, or has had or have had a taste of of being able to compete against teams in the championship and in the Premier League but once they have to do it on a consistent basis um, there has to be you know a, a step up in their game maybe step up in, in two tiers in order to be able to to get to so so. When we were talking about Gabriel Sara, he's already established. He was playing in the best league in this part of the world already. The physicalities are... <laughs> Chilean football has its physicality. Sometimes it's over-physicality at, at times. But the speed of the game, the intensity of the game, the technicality of the game in Brazil is 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 the Premier League, if you want to look at it from that perspective. And if you look mm-hmm. at Chilean football, it's about two, three tiers down as of right now. Because of the economics, because of, of 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 the, I mean, I'm not sure if 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 championship teams have a reserve tournament, but let's 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 say that you know, they but they do have, they do have tournaments in which their youth systems are able to, to be able to participate. Yeah, so, that that's been a change in English football that you can do that in the yeah. um in the Papa John's Trophy. Yeah, well, well, Chile doesn't have that. You know, the the reserves or even the the youth players don't have a consistent tournament where they can continue developing. It's well, we'll have the little tournament here, have a little tournament there. And, and that's more of an FA issue than let's say, blame it on Marcelino Nunez for him not to be able to develop. It's just, he's just a victim of that particular system where there is no reserve tournament. There is no c- constant youth tournament where they maybe play 20, 25, 30, 35 games a season. If they play that, it's a miracle. So, so you understand what I'm saying. So, when they make that jump into the, then, then all of a sudden they have to be able to step up, which he did. And basically, he's one of those few players that's been able to step up in such a way where months after he ends up getting consistent playing time, not to say he was a starter, mm-hmm. he ends up becoming an important part of the team, and of course, therefore, ends up being a starter. So, so a good gauge of his ability will be, mm-hmm. I've noticed he's played, I think it's just over a dozen games in the Copa Libertadores. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's played a few Copa Sudamericana games as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably a good gauge of his ability, how he, how he steps up to the continental level. Mm-hmm. Has he made an impact on that level as well for Universidad Católica? He has, the team hasn't. Okay, but he <laughs> stood out as a good player. He stood out. Team. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he stood out. He stood out as a very good player on, on a team that just wasn't up to snuff and, and i'll be honest with you Ucatolica, not just Ucatolica, but chilean football in general hasn't been up to snuff in terms of continental play over mm-hmm. the past five or six years yeah Catolica had the, the one of their best runs last year but it still wasn't enough because then they ended up facing palmeiras and getting blown out of the water yeah that's interesting. Another aspect that interests me about this transfer, mm-hmm. and I'll give a bit of credit to Adam Brandon, who is a, a Norwich City fan based in South America, I think mm-hmm. in Chile, actually. Yeah. Uh, and he was telling us that there's a, a Chilean reality TV show where, uh, you probably know this story, um, where Mar- Marcelino Nunez, his family, he comes from quite a poor family, from quite yes. a poor background. And they, they were essentially... Um, I think he met a couple of the producers, him and I think it was his father, stopped because a couple of the producers from the show were having trouble changing a tire on a car. And then they, they, sort of, they ended up as part of this reality TV show as a result of that chance meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, so not so much the reality TV element, but I'm getting the, the sort of growing up in a poor area. And I think... Obviously, in the in the sort of more westernized world where commodities are plentiful, it may be quite hard for some people to picture what that's like. I'm sure it's fairly abject poverty in in some areas of Chile, and with that, extremely in mind, abject. In his case, extremely abject poverty. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. how do you think that has influenced him as a character? So, I'm I'm thinking more of his personality here, and then how we can then attribute that to his ability to go abroad, to integrate, 
Um, so there's there's various aspects here. There's there's the mm-hmm. cultural integration aspect, and then level of ambition, hunger, because that's it's obviously going to be more prevalent with someone who's lifted themselves out of that mm-hmm. abject or is hopefully. I mean, he, I'm, I'm sure he's going to earn more money with Norwich than he did with Ukadolika. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nice to see these stories where where players come from that and 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 then can can lift their family out of that. But that creates a yeah. hunger. That that need to break out of that creates a hunger that's mm-hmm. maybe not present and and some players say coming through academies in the UK or whatever. Yeah. So how do you think that's molded him as a character? And do you think that has helped him push on to become a better player than he might have been in a different situation? His family's been able to ground him. And it's not me saying this. This is this is him saying it. That that every time that in every time that he's been interviewed and he talks about his future, he talks about his present, he talks about his family and how his family has been very one of the I mean, people forget this a lot of times that, that one of the most important things that, that people need to have when when you're looking at at an athlete is to have a a a um, a, a a nucleus that's very pro you that, that that's very and what i mean is that they have no qualms and no fears of saying no to you okay a lot of a lot of these young players that are for all intents and purposes the potential or actually are the breadwinners for their for their families well a lot of times they end up going into situations where their family says well you know they're the ones that are maintaining us we can't say no to anything they they do or say hmm that ends up being a very poisonous situation because then the player ends up, you have, I mean, and I I bring this point first and foremost, because once you have your father saying, I don't care how much money you earn, I'm still your father. I'm still your mother. I'm still your brother and sister. I think that's a bad idea. Hey, you know what? You haven't made it yet. You haven't done anything yet. You're still on route two. You still have to do this and they support you and, and, and they, they make sacrifices in their life in order for you. I mean, there was times that he was he himself would say, look, I was making the trip. Mind you, Santiago might look small on a map, but it is a very dense and it's a very complicated city to get around in certain aspects, especially if you're poor. Even I guess I, I should highlight, even if, if you have money and you're affluent, yes, it's, it's a much easier city to get along or, or get, get around. He would mm-hmm. talk about him taking almost two and a half, three hours to get from his house to San Carlos de Apoquindo, which is where, where Universidad Católica are, are, are find themselves. So he's mm-hmm. taking a trip two, three hours north of this, uh, south of the city to north of the city or northwest of the city or northeast of the city, I should say, in order to go train. Mind you, he's doing this at 13, 14, 15 years of age. It wasn't until he was 17 when the team actually says, "Hey, by the way, would you like to would you like to stay at our residence?" For him, that was that wow. was a huge step up. Just just the, the team saying, "Hey, you know what? Instead of making that trek, instead of and, and mind you, there were moments where he did not have the money. His family mm-hmm. did not have the money for the bus fare in order for him to be able to go to train. So he had to find different ways. His family his family had to find different ways to to gather money to be able to get the bus fare for him to go." There were times he even say, "Look, I had nothing to eat." In order for you know for for him to make that trek and then go and play ball, he said, "Look, football solved my problems." Whenever I I had a, he says I had a lot of complications when I was a kid, and you know what solved my problems going on the pitch and playing football. Mm-hmm. Escapism. It's, it it is exactly. Look in South America, in, in, in there's a, there's a saying: What type of hunger does a player have? Okay, and it's it's very interesting because if you look at it from that perspective, uh, yeah, I'm hungry. I'll go, you know, I'll go eat a piece of bread and and, and have you know have some soda. Am I full? Maybe, or have a sandwich mm-hmm. and yeah, okay, so I'm satisfied. So so is it that type of hunger, or is it hey, you know what? Yeah, this is good, but I want more. This is good, but my goal is this. You know, so so you end up dealing with a lot of players from those types of backgrounds where the sandwich and the Coke is good enough for them. Do you know what, man? I'm so glad that you said that because my brain had kind of calculated a question of that Mm -hmm. elk 
and I was thinking on the basis of when you're saying about getting to the training centre and all of that, so many players could at that point go, do you know what, I've made it. That's it. Like, I've, I've, I've done it. I've achieved the ambition, you know. Um, by getting to I don't know first team level and and or, or on the cusp mm-hmm. of it and and knowing that you're going to be a professional, you know, yeah. it's like that's going to be enough to sustain my family. But there's a difference between that and the burning hunger. And I'm hoping that you're going to going to confirm my suspicions. But does it strike you that Marcelino Nunez has that burning hunger, that desire, the the, the passionate drive there to be great, or do you think that still remains to be seen? Yeah, no, no, it, it's it is that because be, that's like awesome, I said, man. Because he's he's even mentioned he's look my he was in saying last year he's like look this is my last year I want to go to Europe. Perfect, you know I want to go to Europe I want to do this. Kid and, knows and, his mind then like that's that's the other thing because if you mm-hmm. if you come from a poorer background sometimes obviously access to education or whatever might not be the same so mm-hmm. for someone to be so confident and so so assertive, I mean that's yeah. quite a really good sign about his character yeah. as well. Now that it happens or not, that's a different story. I mean, I'm not going to go and start, you know, putting my hand on the fire and saying, "Oh yeah, you know, he, you know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe he gets there and he sees his first paycheck, and that's good enough for him. Mm-hmm. You know, he goes and stays in Europe a couple of years. He can earn enough to be able to live his entire life in Chile and, and maintain his family with that. That's not that, mind you. There's no sin in that. Of but, course. But the, but you know, everyone everyone's career is their career, and the decisions they make during that career is are, are theirs and theirs exclusively to to maybe able to enjoy or maybe even regret completely mm-hmm. up to them but when you start seeing what he wants to do he's like look this is what i'm trying to do. And, and even more so it, it was ratified when he went in, in with the national team he said look yeah i was awestruck because i'm seeing i'm i'm training forget forget talking i'm training and and and, and having to exchange ideas with with players on the national team that are my idols mm-hmm so he's like, you know, Arturo Vidal and, Ay, Vidal, and, and, and Alec, Alexis Sanchez and, and, and everybody else, Charles Arangis and, and, and all these players. And he's like, basically, they've been my idols. I've seen them since, you know, since I was a little kid. And now to be able to train alongside them and hear them and, and, and get ideas from them and have them tell me, hey, by the way, you got to keep doing this, 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 this and that. It shows that he's listening and, and he wants to be like that. He wants to be at that level, and 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 I think that's a positive. How is his physical side of the game? Because a lot of the highlights, the the vision, the technique, mm-hmm. the ability to to see a pass and play the pass, all of the all of the things that Norwich City have been clamoring for since mm-hmm. the departure of Emmy Buendia. To be honest, you can mm-hmm. see all of those aspects. Mm-hmm. What you can't really tell in those highlights, and this is probably partly because of what you're saying about the 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 disparity in level, time in the game, or time in the ball, sorry, all of that kind of stuff. But when I look at him, I see the vision, I see the technique. What you can't tell is physically how he is. So what is he like physically as a specimen? He need, he needs more filling. He need, he he needs more filling, and I think if 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 guided properly he can do proper it. conditioning and training yeah. and nutrition and all of those things yeah yeah I, I mean i mean it improved over the last year and change because he's understood what he needs to do is it on point maybe but one thing's for sure when he does get to europe that will end up being being one of the things now and it was interesting and and i, I say this as an aside mm-hmm. because it was interesting because I heard Jorge Valdano the other day, and he he gave a great interview on on the identity of South American football, and I think that Marcelino okay. Nunez does fall into this. Um, you know, th- there's a certain thing in Argentina or in Chile even that they call potrero, which is the street. He mm-hmm. has a lot of that. He has a lot of street in him. He has a lot of of of, of cunning. A lot of yeah, so uh, so that's the idea that you you you've yeah. got that spark of magic, but also that that sort of <coughs> you will fight and you will win mm-hmm. in any way possible. Mm-hmm. That's what Portrero's getting at, yeah. Yeah, wit, you know, being being witty, being street smart, you know, things that you don't learn, and and, and the academization of, of certain players. Mm-hmm. And, and Valdano was saying uh, the academy format, the academy setting, makes mediocre players better, but it brings different players down to their level. Yeah. Now that is the big question in terms That's of fascinating, man. Like, of send, how, send me that after this because I want to read that. 
Val, yeah, Valdano, Valdano talks about that. And there's certain players that have those qualities, but when they get into an academy setting, that level ends up coming out. Now, what makes him a bit different in terms of that is that he's been able to acquire the, the, those attributes from the academy and he's been able to somewhat maintain himself and, and be himself and, and, and still be able to, to kind of have those moments, that that, that spark, that uh, that cunning and, and improvise in situations where decision-making is so crucial and instead of being roboticized to a certain extent, He's been yeah. able to to truly make different decisions in, in situations where other players would probably just end up booting the ball and sending it, you know, into the stands. And, and he's been able to kind of do something different with the ball. He's been able to play out wide. He plays out wide in. He plays inside out. That type of thing. He's he's able to to like you said, the vision that he has to send the right pass mm -hmm. in the right area or send it instead of sending it you know, on the ground, sending it over, being able to chip it over the defenders and finding the space behind behind the defender's back or being able to, to find that the defender's not standing right. Those That's what I can see. Obviously, if you watch a lot of football, you can notice sort of subtle things about a player, even mm -hmm. in sort of small pockets of video, that will tell you mm -hmm. maybe maybe more about them than, than, than just, oh, that was a great pass, you know? Mm -hmm. And the thing that I saw about him was a great understanding of space and pace. Yeah. So players running on to balls, as you say, whether to elevate the pass, whether to play it through, bit of curl on it maybe. He just seemed to have that natural gift to do all of those things. The the big challenge for players like that, especially being taken, and in terms of football has, has a different culture and a different approach. Wherever you go in the world, there's different methodologies at play. I mean, at the truly elite level, I think that Vogdano... Um, thing sounds really interesting because I think mm -hmm. there is there's been a homogenization of football at the top level which kind of mm -hmm. has made me fall out of love with truly elite football so that's mm -hmm. that's an aside of mine but the challenge for the likes of Nunez coming from where he has been and then going to a completely different football culture and the the disparity is is pretty big in terms of in terms of the way even even to what the fans appreciate on the field you know um is very, very different. He does have all of the kind of magical qualities that, as you say, make for a, a, a very a very natural footballer, is, mm -hmm. is what I would say. He seems to be yeah. a very natural footballer. But in the championship, in the English championship, and especially with the way that Dean Smith is looking to make Norwich City play, there seems to be more of a, an emphasis on pace and power and strength. And um, we've mentioned about the time and the ball thing. All mm -hmm. of these aspects, and these are all for me big question marks. He looks like a wonderful footballer. He looks like a a fantastic talent, and definitely one that the Norwich City could nurture and move on for for big, big, big mm -hmm. money if if mm -hmm. he's handled correctly. Mm -hmm. But the balance for the likes of a team like Norwich City is they've got to do that, but they've got to win in the championship. Yeah, they've got to win, and then when they get to the Premier League, the idea this time is that the team actually competes to stay in the league with with more than just a meek whimper going back down and falling out of the division. Yeah. And my, my, my wonder is, can Nunez be a player that can can bridge that gap? Obviously, with Emi Buendia, he had a spell at Gaddafi in Europe. So mm -hmm. that was that was a step, sort of, almost like an intermediary step, whereas this is, yeah. this is the leap, this is the full jump. And that that's my question. I think it sounds like he's got the character to do it. Um, my, my question would be around, does he, is his body going to be up to it? And I think it's one of those where it could be, it could be a slow burner in terms of it could maybe take him a year. It could, could maybe yeah. take him a year to fully acclimate, you know? Yeah. Um, but when he does, I think it's going to go one of two ways. I think the transfer is either going to be a, a flop or I think he's going to soar. And like, yeah, I, I'm more excited personally yeah, about I this mean, he, transfer than Sarah. I don't know about you. What What do you think is the more exciting move if you were a Norwich City fan? The, uh, I mean, it's kind of a gamble. It's like, okay, w w you know, do I put you know a hundred quid on 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 X horse and know that I'm gonna be able to win two hundred and fifty, <laughs> or on uh, you know putting a you know putting a hundred and knowing that there is a possibility, although minimal, that I could earn maybe 10000 with the other one. Mm -hmm. 
you know so you, you see that a bit like this where Sarah's probably a more surefire bet to be a success but mm -hmm. Nunez is the one who could the, be yeah the, the odds the, like the super splash yeah the, 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 the I mean mind you we're talking about a player that that was established within a club compared to a national team player a, a, a full bona fide national team player at mm -hmm. this point so does he have the character yes um The times that he ends up going with the national team it might serve as an oasis a bit for him to kind of recharge and listen to someone else. Uh, I mean, I, I vision I, at least more what I see from him is being able to be that player that pulls the strings and sends a deep pass into the area for a player running on to be able to get to the ball. And, and mm -hmm. he ends up being that type of player. It, again, if you're expecting him to be an, an immediate impact, I don't know. I, 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 can, I can honestly tell you right now, I don't know. Uh, but knowing his mentality, knowing his what he his his drive, I think that it can be more successful than not, and he'll do whatever it takes to be successful there. Mind mm -hmm. you, I mean, I mean, like we we already, already discussed this part before, that whatever pressure he he endures at Norwich is nothing compared to what the pressures that he has endured with his, his entire life. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, let's be honest. I mean. You know, people say well you know what about the pressure of being criticized you know what about the pressure of trying to be able to put food on your table that, that ends up being difference. yeah that's the difference and he's dealt with that he's like look anything that, that you know and, and and at that point he knows that he can bring his family over he knows that he has the luxury of being able to, to have that nucleus there with him if need be mm -hmm. and, and he does have the support of of other players in the national team well, the homesick. I mean, th this would be one of the first times in his life where he leaves the country, much less. That, that, see, that's that's the bit, Juan. It's mm -hmm. the, in terms of culture shock mm -hmm. uh, of the whole thing. Now, don't get me wrong. I think it's great the the, the yeah. thing they do in the algorithm of the football manager video game, where mm -hmm. it's like if you bring another player from that country or that region uh, to a club, then they're more likely to become friends and settle. That that's real. Mm -hmm. Gabriel Sara and Marcelino Nunez being together at Norwich City and being put into that situation together mm -hmm. is probably going to, unless they're very, very different characters, it's going to forge a strong friendship between those guys, I would imagine. Um, it should. It could. It should. It should. And, and obviously, as a Norwich fan, we hope it could. In terms mm -hmm. of the bona fide national team bit, just, just to give people a flavour um, and throw some stats, because people like their stats. Uh, for Universidad Católica, um, 82 games, 11 goals. 12 assists in that time. No red cards mm. as well, mm. I noticed. And a, a fairly clean disciplinary record. So I, I don't see much. Um, I, I'm just looking at figures on a sheet here, Juan. But mm. I don't see much in terms of temperament or worries that way. Um, I mean, d d d does he seem quite... Because uh, you see he's quite grounded by his family and stuff. No, he's, 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 okay. Yeah, he, he's not. I mean, uh, fiery when he needs to be. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing's one thing's fiery. Another thing is just you know being petulant, yeah, or petulant or losing the head, yeah, or Marcos Rojo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, exactly. that that you know, he's not the type that's going to come in and try and say, "Hey, he, here I am, alpha male." No, not 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 that type of player where he tries to impose himself over. Everyone. No, no, he's hey, look, he's he's part of part of a team. He never ended up being an elder statesman for that, and he, and he had his reverence towards the older players on the squad. He's still an ongoing project. So of course, I, mean, I don't think he'd be at Norwich City if he wasn't. One one thing that sticks out though, just mm -hmm. on the on the international thing that I was going to come to, is mm -hmm. his debut was in September 2021, and his next mm -hmm. cap will be his tenth international cap. He's already mm -hmm. scored as well for Chile. Yeah. Um, that says a lot to me. That that says that that's someone who's gone into the international fold and is already trusted, uh, and and is already making an impact to the point yeah. that they probably can't be left out the squad now. Uh, mind you, mind you, he, he he has a teammate in the championship too. Uh, how how long is he going to stay? That's a different story. And Ben Brereton, yeah, Ben Brereton, ben Brereton Diaz, Diaz yeah. yeah. So that's true. Um, and Blackburn Rovers, I, I watched one of their games in, in pre-season. They're mm -hmm. going to be an interesting team to watch this season. John Dow yeah. Thompson's got a more, more physical approach, more organised, and all of the things, I've commentated quite a few Blackburn games, all of the mm -hmm. things that they've really been lacking. And I think Ben Brereton Diaz, they've lost an important player in midfield and Joe Rothwell. But mm -hmm. if, you can, if you can supplement his goal scoring with a bit of solidity, then mm -hmm. I think Blackburn could go up this year. 
Yeah, and and, and mind you, and and he 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 saw what Ben was able to do in Chile. Yeah, you know, Ben goes to the national team, doesn't know. I mean, I was going to ask, he, does he speak he, Spanish, man? No, I mean, he so, knows a couple of words. His Spanish has gotten better now compared to when he first started. But the mm -hmm. thing is that that that. that People in Chile fell head over heels in love with Ben with Ben Brereton Diaz. Amazing what because, a few goals will do, man. <laughs> but, well, that too, and and that helped a lot. And, and, and if he would have struggled, I don't think he'd be at the point where where he is in Chile. In Chile, he's in Chile. He's one of the biggest marketing. He's one of the most marketable players in Chile right now. He he's done commercials. I mean, you, you've probably seen I never, them. I never knew he was that. Obviously, we've not we've not seen that, and we've we've seen the goals. But I didn't mm -hmm. realize that it had captured oh, the, the sort of Chilean cultural zeitgeist he's huge. so much. That's he's fascinating. Huge. He's huge. He's huge over in Chile, and and, and he got and and obviously uh, Marcelino got to see some of it, not all of it, because of course there was a portion of, of this year that Ben has been injured and he's been in recovery, and he mm -hmm. and, and he still was was looking to he would he would still do things. Hey, you know, supporting the team from afar. And, and, and talking about how he wanted to see Chile in the World Cup, and and he was doing everything possible, so he got to see that firsthand, and seeing, well, if this guy can do it, damn, I could do it over there. Yeah, you know, so so you do have that as well, in, in, as a reference. Hey, you know what? My teammate had to do it inversely compared to what mm -hmm. I'm doing right now, and maybe that's going to be something that can help him out and yeah, having that support system there. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's, that's a really interesting point. And it's good for him to have someone else over here, maybe out with the Norwich City bubble mm -hmm. that they can bounce off and, and, and maybe chat to. Um, yeah. Like, depending on depending on, on how well uh, it, 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 conversational Spanish is. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, it was it was funny because the words that... I mean, it was funny because you'd see the, the Chilean FA and many of the, of the teammates, he, of his teammates on the Chilean national team, the only thing he knew were the curse words. Well, and it, it it was just it, it was the most hilarious thing. But as a neutral, it, it enamored you with with the entire relationship. Imagine how it, it yeah. Because people don't are, people don't are, people from the United States, people in Europe don't understand that the fact that, that he just wanted to play with him. And same thing with Gianluca Lapadula over over in Peru. That's another glaring example I can give you. Just the fact that they want to be part of, of, of the culture ends up being very important to them. It means a great deal yeah. to them. Like, oh, you know, this guy that, you know, his mother was Chilean and, and, his, and, and, and his culture, and he never really had much to do with it until now, has gotten so attached to it. It means a great deal to them, even if he only knows curse words. Yeah, but that, I, I, I mean, at the same time, though, I, mm -hmm. I know from watching the Scottish national team that mm -hmm. there are players, normally English players, to be honest, mm -hmm. that do come from elsewhere, and sometimes they just they get it, you know? Uh, yeah. Like R Russell Martin at Norwich was one. Like, absolutely loved playing for Scotland. Proud as punch to do so. And even now he spat with that accent. Like, I mean, Russ, Russ is a Scot. Like, I, I consider Russ to be a Scot. And mm -hmm. that's... So I think that's an important factor. I think um, another interesting aspect of this... Um, you were mentioning about the elder statesman in the in the Chile team. Chile haven't had uh, Arturo Vidal, Alexis Sanchez, standard player really coming through in the last few years as 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 far as I would interpret levels. Right, that's two mm -hmm. at their peak. Vidal for a lot longer, Sanchez for a, for a shorter spell, but world class operators. Is Marcelino is Marcelino Nunez? Is he potentially a world class operator? Could he get to that level? Maybe not be that level, because like I think Vidal is one of the he, he's in my opinion one of the best South American players mm -hmm. in the last like twenty years. Definitely, mm -hmm. I think he's an absolute Rolls Royce of footballer. Um, yeah. I remember watching him in the Under Twenty World Cup, and he was playing centre back, and he looked like Franz Beckenbauer. Um, I think it was before he came to Europe, and I was like, this guy, mm -hmm. this guy's going to be really good, <laughs> and so it turned out. Yeah. Do you think do you think Nunez has that much of a leap in him, or maybe just a rung below that? Um, below, a little below. Now, fair enough. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, we could because Arturo Vidal was basically in Chile was already a star at that age. Alexis Sanchez was already blowing up at yeah. seventeen, eighteen. I, I, I mean, 
Alexis Sanchez was starting at 16. Mm. You know, he was at River by the time he was 18. So, I mean, it ends up being a totally different reference in turn. I mean, people don't understand how, how, how special that generation of Chilean players happened to be that oh, were yeah. all congregated at the same time and did so much for Chilean football. Now, of course, the biggest scar they're going to have is not qualifying for two consecutive World Cups. Yeah. But at the same time, there hasn't been anyone that's truly come down, you know, and, and part of the reason why Ben Brett and Diaz ends up getting brought into the Chilean national team. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and obviously goals. If you can get goals from anywhere, it's important. There's, well, that, that's you know, that's that's always been a problem with Chile. They, they, they you know, Edu Vargas is one of those anomaly, you know, anomalies where he didn't play very well at the club team at the club level, but was always tearing it up with the national team. And and you you didn't have that bona fide goal scorer up top. Uh, you know, maybe the goal scores that Chile had were. A generation before that with Ivan Samorano and Marcelo Salas, and wow. so on and so forth. What a great force that was, man. Yeah. And, and then now in the, with this gen, you didn't have well, I'll take that back. Alexi Sanchez was, was a goal scoring, but I was a way forward, really, though, wasn't he? Like exactly a striker. Yeah, exactly. You didn't have that out not number nine, if you will, that was able to to truly, you know, strike the fear of God in people. It was every it was Alexi Sanchez and everyone behind them that truly did. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I just thought I would I would shoot for the stars there, a bit of a hail mary right down the field. But mm -hmm. um, I think with Nunez, I think Norwich City have the chance of a, a really good prospect and, mm -hmm. and and someone that if handled correctly could could have a really good tenure with the club. And the nature is Norwich City, if if players do develop as as you hope that they will, then the club is more than likely going to be a stepping stone just because of the, the construct of the finances, English football, global football as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the nature of the beast. And if Norwich City can get three or four good years out of a player like that and really bring them on and make a massive profit on them, then that's, excuse me for hitting the mic there, that's mm -hmm. about the best that, that Norwich City, I think, can, can hope for from a player like that. Let's do a, let's do a kind of comparative thing now, though. So mm -hmm. I kind of alluded to this when when I said um, when we said about Sarah being the the horse that's that's more likely to come in in the paddock, and then then Nunez being the one that could be the the sort of the big money shot that you you, you expect a little less. Obviously, the the outlay for Sarah is considerably more. That's probably I think to do with the fact he's coming from Brazil, not Chile. Do you think mm -hmm. the the difference in price tag is? reflective of of where they're at ability wise potential wise no um, well well it could it could it could and um on top of that it's a reality i mean, I mean people um, mm. people outside of argentina and brazil say you know what's your one of your best moves mm -hmm. the best marketing move for for a player is to go to brazil and argentina because your price tag goes up if you go directly from Chile, from Colombia, from even Mexico or or, or, or or Uruguay or, well, I guess Uruguay, you can also add them a little bit more towards the Argentina, Brazil to a certain extent. But any other, other any any country from South America, even and like I even said, Mexico or Central America, that same, if you, players, uh, you know, two like players, the price tag is going to go up significantly if it was, yeah, if he was thought. from Argentina or brazil it's just the reality it's just you know the, the brand the branding of the player you know and, and 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 even if he played for boca or river add more money to it if he exactly. plays for sao paulo it's, it's the weight of the, the country weight of the club all mm -hmm. of these things are a factor and then the the situation of the player th mm -hmm. themselves i think I think it's fair to say that if Gabriel Sara hadn't got injured had, had continued to put in really good performances he may have got a move that would have taken him to a situation that he would have preferred other than Norwich City. There's, I mean, these are one of these kind of could have, would have, should have sort of mm -hmm. happened. Nunez, I feel, is that seems to me like a, a really a really clever piece of, of scouting by Norwich City in, in terms of, I think they're getting a player. I'm not sure how it's working with the work permit, but I'm sure the fact that he's played nine games with Chile has, mm -hmm. has obviously had a, had a big bearing on that. Rather not, than... Not, yeah. Not only not only nine not only nine ten games nine ten games over the last year, 
Exactly. So yeah. there's that there's that consistency in the fact that they can then point it and say, look, this, this kid's barring injury going to be pretty much an automatic selection in the squad and likely to play mm-hmm. in the team for most games. So that's that's a factor. Mm-hmm. With, the, with the way it's worked post-Brexit with the work permits, um, the Brazilian league, the Argentinian league and, and the Mexican league are obviously areas where Norwich City can prioritise scouting for players that maybe don't have as many international caps. Obviously, Sara comes into that bracket. Um, but in, in terms of the two players and in terms of stylistically, so to give you an impression of, of the, the formation that Norwich City are playing also, by the way, because um, I think this will make you laugh, uh, I don't know, are you, are you a fan of expected goals um, as, a, as a calibration of anything to do with football? Because you know the XG thing, there's been X, XG exploded on the scene a few years ago. Is that, because mm-hmm. commentators I speak to, Juan, they're either a big fan of it or not so much. Where do you come on the old XG debate? Are are you a fan of dysentery? <laughs> right. So there, there's my answer. But if you want to know if um, Norwich City need a bit of creativity uh, mm-hmm. in terms of the midfield, mm-hmm. um, total shots one half through in our championship this season. Mm-hmm. Cardiff have had one shot in the game and it was on target. Norwich City have had three with one of them on target. So I think it's safe to say that we could be doing with a bit of imagination, a bit of creativity in that middle area, because I definitely in the last couple of games of preseason, which I commented upon, Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a lot of that. I saw a lot of bypassing the midfield and and Norwich City really needing some creativity in there. Formation-wise, what Norwich City are tending to do is that formation that can be either interpreted as a Mm 4-3-3, I prefer to interpret it as a Mm -hmm. 4-1-4-1 in terms of the way that Norwich City are playing it with a wide target man uh, on one side, an inverted winger on the other, uh, Temu Puki, uh, more than likely going to be leading the line for Norwich City throughout the season. Mm-hmm. And then one sitting midfielder with two around him. I imagine that Norwich City could play with Sara and Nunez in there. That's mm-hmm. that's the way that I would see it. So two, two number eights maybe kind of thing. Uh, and then a proper sitting screening. Uh, midfielder behind them. How would you yeah. see the balance of a midfield with those two in terms of um, like style of play, but also balance in terms of shape, in terms of right foot, left foot, all of the, the different aspects that make up the balance of a team? If, if you... I mean, I, 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 I agree with you. I'd probably see him playing in that four one four one somewhere in the middle of that you know, I'm trying to trying to visualize it a little bit. You see the obviously Sada would probably be playing out wide, playing in. So you think and of then, him maybe playing in as as one of the wide guys. So if it, if you did look, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking about Sada, and then may or or maybe even Marcelino Nunez playing out wide. Now, and I'm trying to find Ooh. out where where where, where Sada would be playing in, in all this. I, I think he'd probably be playing wide, and maybe I wouldn't even say four one four one because the one on the on, on the right side would be further up more towards the middle or, or dropping back and, and being able to associate himself. <clears throat> yeah, the way it's been is it's been the wide target man on the right mm-hmm. and then Milo Rashica, who is an inverted winger on the left, cutting in. Yeah. The right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, yeah. That's so, yeah I mean, so, 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 so in all intents and purposes, you have a lot going to, I mean, it, it, for lack of a better term, funneling in towards goal, being able to, to kind of, to, to gather your resources and, and try and take them as close to goal or or at goal as possible. And and now, is he going to be that player that's going to go in and and add himself as an attacking option? Depends. But I do see him in in the development of play being that player that okay. Now, if 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 we end up seeing that Norwich ends up like you just said, skipping lines and sending deep balls to Timo Puki or whoever's out wide. And, and all Marcelino Nunez is doing is looking up and seeing the ball go over his head. No, it's not going to be a successful spell for him. But yeah. if you end up if you end up having him as one of those players that transports the ball or, or efficiently makes that transition from, from defense to offense or from midfield into creation, then you end yeah. up having a player that can truly – make Timo Puki his best friend, to be quite honest with you. That, and that could be key. Is the thinking. And 
What what I think is happening at the moment, Juan, is it's to do with talent available mm-hmm. to Norwich City. I think I think the the style of play or lack of it, as, mm-hmm. as um, many people might might put it, I think is down to the talent that is available on the ground at the moment. Mm-hmm. I think once Gabriel Sara is fit and um, Nunez comes in and, and gets up to speed, mm-hmm. I, I think the style of play will quite naturally change just by virtue of the talent mm-hmm. that you've got available. When Emi Buendia was at Norwich City, Norwich City played in a way that managed to get the best out of his abilities. And I think that was important. Um, I'm going to talk about Sarah and Nunez for, for the remaining small portion of this podcast. About <laughs> dogs. I know you need to go and yes. you're a busy man. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I'm going to talk about them together because I, I see it really as a pairing that we're waiting to, to impact the team and, and hopefully give a bit of, hopefully knit together that, that middle third. So rather than bypassing the lines, as you say, actually working it through the middle and playing some football and doing some of the stuff that, that Norwich City have over the last few years um, under Daniel Farker prior to Dean Smith coming in, what has really been the hallmarks of the play. Um, so what I'm going to ask you, I'm, I'm going to ask you on both players, uh, and it's going to be a double-handed question on two players. First rule of journalism, don't ask more than one question in one go, mm-hmm. but I know that you are good enough to handle this. Okay. So, um, Sarah and Nunez, how, what is their their ability in terms of um, interplay with fullbacks? Because I think that's an area where Norwich City are quite strong in terms of the mm-hmm. personnel. Max Aarons, Dimitri Shunilis, blah, blah, blah. Um, so what are they like in terms of playing with speedy fullbacks? Is that something that they can they, they can do quite well? And then what are they both like in terms of taking charge of a game in the midfield area? And how are, good are they at winning possession near the opposition goal. So three, three and one for two players. Um, so tackle them in the order you will. I'll write them down so I remember them in case you Yeah, forget. yeah, just in, just in case, please do. Uh, I'll start with the, with the last one first in terms of of, of, uh, of Marcelino and Sara. Uh, well, Sara, we, we, I already mentioned what he can do, what he can't do in terms of, of, of attacking and in terms of, of being able to drop back and become part of, of the team overall, of course, that was one of the big keys for for um, Rogerio Seni when, when he took over and seeing him being able to develop. Uh, but but let me focus more on, on Marcelino Nunez because he wasn't in a position where he had to recover balls, but overall he was a player that could recover them. He was a player that does like to get into the dirt, into, into that muck if he, if need be, which is basically part of Chilean football. Timo Puki, mm-hmm. Gabriel Sara. Josh Sargent was supposed to be playing as well, right? Yeah, he's the white target man in the right. So I think that he also could get a great deal of benefit from him from him as well. How so? When you start to see when he becomes, I guess, a general in that middle, and he's he because he wants to give movement to the ball first and foremost. Let's not, you know, all the things, all the magic and all these, yeah, that's all wonderful and, and, and the flair is great too. But what does make him tick is being able to keep the ball in motion. He gets it, turns, goes. He gets it, turns, goes. And I say he gets it, turns, goes when he has three or four touches. Now, assuming he does fit in and is molded into what is needed over at at Nord City, you're going to see him being able to move the ball back and forth, being able to find the wide players, being able to find Timo Puki, being able to to associate himself better in that aspect and, and being able to give cleaner balls. It's not just, hey, let's punt and hope. Because yeah. he's going to be able, he's going to be that player that's going to be able to give to the players that we already mentioned before the ball at their feet, which is very important. Instead of Josh Sargent chasing or Gabriel Sara having to go in and hunt the ball down, they get it at their feet. They can maximize their 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 respective qualities. So, and and in that, not only being able to not have to go and get the ball. When you're able to do it and you're able to do it at your feet and you're able to be transporting it or dribbling it or passing it around, that mm-hmm. let, let, okay, let, let's let's use expected goals. Most likely, when you have those types of teams that do have higher expected goals, is because they're not just punting the ball down the pitch and, and, and seeing if one guy is able to win it and beat out two, maybe three defenders. 
it's it's teams that cleanly are able to play the ball out of the back or, or be able to transport it and move it around properly, finding the spaces, picking their defenses apart, and being able to find the right person and make the right decision in front of goal. Exactly. So he One does of the offer in the you that. Them, by the way, like, yeah, of, of that. But carry on. But I mean, but but if if you want again, statistics are great, but statistics aren't your crutch. Statistics are are, are what kind of amplify an argument. They're not what make your argument. So if, if you start looking at it from that perspective, then yes, he does offer that. Gabriel Sara does offer that. But it, it, it's it's something that might go against what Norwich City have been playing recently, which is, like you've said before, sending it deep, skipping lines. And As I say, though, I think that identity will be... I think the identity will be dictated by who's on the field somewhat. Mm -hmm. So I think having these two players available... And obviously, Norwich City haven't done a major amount of transfer business. That's two of the three players that have been brought in. Mm -hmm. The other one's Isaac Hayden, who's a sitting midfielder, um, to trade. So I, I think that tells you exactly where Norwich City feel that they are in terms of their business. So they're bringing in these players. And I imagine that unless there's there's a real challenge with the, the adaptation process, I think this these are both players that Norwich City see as as focal points this season as players that are are going to come in and hopefully impact and I actually think it would be safe to say that Norwich City are are betting on that somewhat because having done so little business that said players have come in from from loan spells in the championship last season so the squad has been supplemented in some other ways mm -hmm. but in in terms of new faces through the door that's two out of the three so that tells me that Norwich City are very much hoping that these two guys can can make an impact. Can you foresee a situation where they're the the middle pairing in the in the four three three? If you look at it like that, so um, not not deploying Sar out wide or anything like that, having them mm -hmm. those two as the central pair in front of a sitting midfielder. Uh, you're, talk you're talking about Sar as a midfielder. So I'm talking about well, Sar as me. a kind of as a number eight. So when, when we did our podcast the last time, you said he the, the kind of number eight and that he had mm. a bit of a sort of hybrid thing going on. Yeah, yeah, could, yeah. You could play yeah. deeper and then impose it. Yeah, that's that what that's what I was yeah, that's what I was thinking you're 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 insinuating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I could see that. I could see that. I could, yeah, that, that I would could, be interesting for me. I, I could and uh who who would be your right back? Uh Max Aarons? Max Aarons, yeah. Okay. Uh, again, I'm not going to say that I'm extremely familiar. No, no, that's fine. Do, if you want, I can do, do supplement you because I know do, you know the think, players. Where, where, where do you see Max Aarons in all of this? Again, I have to bring that in because, of course, that's the sector we're talking about. Is he going to be well, dropping We're talking back? about the relationship with fullbacks. So Max yeah. Aarons is going to play on the right-hand side of a defensive mm -hmm. four. Yeah, And Dimitri Shanulis, who had success out in Greece with Pauk, was, uh, let, he'll, he'll be on the left side of a defensive mm -hmm. yeah. four. Those are two pacey, talented attacking fullbacks. Yeah, and then yeah, so. what you'll have is in front of the the, the central pairing in the defence, you'll have a a proper screening sitting midfielder, I believe, whose job it will be to mop up any danger, any overloads mm -hmm. that come, and also to somewhat instigate play going forward. But I imagine they'll pass the ball off, and then it'll be down to a Sara Nunez, whoever plays with a more creative vein in that central area to mm -hmm. try and, and play some football in there. But I think that will be mixed with a sprinkling of long balls, maybe to the likes of a Josh Sargent for a flick on, and then mm -hmm. the, the the quicker attack in play, where then maybe it goes to Timmy Puki and goes beyond, or Puki holds it up, brings it back, and then the second phase of play comes in and you get um, Sarah arriving, Nunez arriving. What's Nunez like around the box, by the way? Um, I see that he scored plenty of goals. What kind of finisher is he? He's a, he's a I mean he, he's he's a decent finisher and, and probably one of the best goals in in, in this past uh, South I mean South South Americana or um, or uh, actually not so I take that back not South Americana they played pretty bad in, in that tournament and uh, mm -hmm. in in Libertadores happened to be him. Mm -hmm. in, I will share that mop, one with the uh, he, can, uh, he can mop he can mop up. The midfield pretty well. He, he I mean, like I said, he, he's he, he, if he needs to get into that muck, if he needs to be able to go in and and, and go into that role, he can do it. Is mm -hmm. it his best? Probably not. Is it the one that you want him to be in? Probably not. Is it the one that you want him to be over anything else? No. 
Mm -hmm. But if he needs to do it, he can. And, and, and I start looking more. You start talking about deep balls. Maybe he's one of those players that ends up winning that second ball and continuing the phase of play, See, whether it's good. opening it up out wide as well. Uh, do you want him being your holding midfielder? <laughs> no, no, you don't. <laughs> uh, but again, if he, if he needs to drop back to be able to defend, you know, he's going to be able to do that. So again, he, he he's very versatile when it comes to that. But again, I, there are certain things you don't want him playing in in, in a more of a defensive role. You don't want him in. No. Um, <laughs> just just where you sort of that week off. I'm thinking uh, around the around the opposition box then. Um, what are they both like, Sara and Nunez, in terms of timing runs into the box and getting on the end of chances? Or are they more likely to maybe sit at the edge of the box and have a pop from long range? Both. That question for both. Bo both. Both can do both. Both can do both. That's really good. <laughs> but, but, okay, well, let, let, me, let me rephrase this because then you're going to think that, well, then why do we get Sara for if, if he's going to just sit around the box? <coughs> if need be, he can do that he also can go into the area he can head the ball he, he can he can be one of those options it's not just okay let's send the ball in and, and hope that if timo puki ends up you know heading it or, or being able to get it that josh Sargent ends up picking up whatever scraps are left no no you end up having a third option inside of the area yeah. maybe even a fourth when it comes to being able to finish off you know certain, certain situations marcelino nunez if he has to go forward, he can. Does he do it often? No. Is he the one that stays outside and waits for, for, for a chance to be able to pop a ball from out from outside of the 18, 18, 20, 25 meters out and score? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is he going to be that player that says, you know, free kick, give me the ball, I can take it? That's your player as well. Mm -hmm. But if you all of a sudden things are desperate and, and, and he has to be that number nine, no, that's not your guy. So, so no, that's let, true. Let's, let, let, mm. let's 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 kind of put things where they are you know and, and not start saying oh you know you know he, he you know he can turn water into wine no he's he's the type of player that this is what he can do if you keep him within this realm of opportunities he can do this but if you put him outside of it maybe you're not getting the best version of him well that, that's one thing that i think dean smith's a, a very tactically aware coach he's got craig shakespeare in there with him mm. um norwich city I think I think do know how to get the best out of, of, of the majority mm -hmm. of players. Usually, if they don't, it's circumstance, situation, various players. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the tactical awareness what they want to do with the footballers, I've got no concerns about that. On the Sarah point, I was actually I was on another podcast, uh, the On the Ball podcast with Michael Bailey on Monday, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I think I had everyone laughing because I mentioned about Sarah's shoulders. Uh, <laughs> and I said, like, have they been photoshopped or something? Because they like the new Norwich City shirt is is really nice, and the way that his shoulders, like, I was so impressed with his physique, Juan. Like, mm -hmm. I thought this is a guy; he has the body to go into English football and be a success. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, we we talked in the, the previous podcast about the injury and and all of that sort of side of it, but on the face of it, he's got the body to succeed and, and the physical capability to succeed yeah. in English football. Nunez is not is not that physically imposing. He's not, he's no. not like Sarah in that regard. No, no, no. So that probably increases the challenge for him a bit because he's going to have to rely... I, I mean, he's obviously going to get physically improved. I think, I think we, mm -hmm. we did mention that earlier in the pod, but I think he's going to have to rely on his footballing ability to succeed, whereas I think Sarah can... Not that not negating the fact he's got the football ability, but he does have the athleticism there as well, which for me gives him a leg up in terms of to start with anyway, with the adaptation process to the English Championship. So mm -hmm. I think for Nunez, there's probably going to be a bit more of a challenge there. Would you concur? Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. He, ha I mean, I, I said it before. He ha his frame has still a lot of filling to do. So, so fr from from that perspective, yeah. Sara does have the upper hand. Uh, Are Catolica a bit behind Brazilian football and sports science and all of that stuff? And how behind England are they? Or is, is that much of a muchness now in terms of the modern football? Because I'm thinking in terms of if Nunez, or do you think it's just a, a sort of factor of in Chilean football, his ability was such that there was no need to worry about the physical frame. So he could kind of 
he could rely on his, his football and ability to make him stand out anyway. But in terms of the actual resources at the player's disposal to improve that side of the game, are Catolica there yet? Are, are they at the, the sort of cusp of the, the modern curve or are they a bit behind? How should I compare this? Oh, okay. Let me put it to you this way. Um, the the championship. Oh, let's, let, the championship. Well, okay. The Premier League, La Liga, Bundesliga are basically like Verstappen, Leclerc, <laughs> and 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 uh, Lewis Hamilton. Okay. Um, not in this year's Mercedes, but carry on. Yeah, yeah. And then, but but overall, let, let's yeah, say yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Say. Um, uh, Catholic or somewhere, I guess, uh, what would be like uh, Alpha Tauri? Okay, not that bad. Uh, I, it, it's getting better, but mm. but let's say, well, not even Alpha, let's say like Force India a few years ago. <laughs> right, I okay. it, it, yeah, Minardi so, back in the day. Yeah, 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 yeah back in the day. That, that's how... Sports science is something that's slowly coming into South American football. A lot of it is still romanticized. Now, what does help with uh, Catolica is that they have a, a coach that's come back in Ariel Holland that, that's very into sports science, that's very into being able to <clears throat> measure performance in, 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 in the GPS. Um, and, and they pay a lot of attention to those types of things. Yeah. Um but it's still very in the infantile stage compared to what it is in Europe. You still yeah. have, you know, I mean, which is good and which is bad. Obviously, more bad than good, but it's still good because you, you as a coach, still have to depend on the eye test. You still have to see what's going on and, and, and offer, hey, the intangibles. Okay, if the player's tired, what does he do? Or, or if a player is, is physically capable, what does he do? Mm -hmm. The nutrition still in South America still le leaves a lot to be desired, especially in some clubs where, I mean, they eat great. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, 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 and if, if you see certain things that, that, that players eat in South America, a lot of parts of South America now, the, 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 the Flamengos and the, and the Palmeiras and the Rivers and the Bocas are a different story. But when Sao you still, Paulo? <clears throat> Sao Paulo? Sao Paulo is pretty much in, in that Palmeiras Right, no. so so Sara has been a bit. Yeah, yeah, he's Sarah. been there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Rogerio Seni, especially with Rogerio Seni, who's a very um, educated and a very uh, well-educated coach in terms of, of what he's been able to do, and, and has gone to Europe and has talked to Pep Guardiola and has talked to many other coaches in terms of being able to, to acquire certain understanding, both tactically and also managerial, when it, when it comes to man managing, you know, things like that. He's been very Europeanized in that perspective, in a good sense. And of course, Abel Ferreira, coming from Portugal, we know what he brings to the table, and many of those coaches. But still, there, there's there's players or there's teams that well, they still have their asado, they still have, you know, their their, their regular diet compared to what they would have, you know, when you have a nutritionist already in place in a place like Norwich City or even in the Premier League. Yeah. Um, so so for that matter. That's that's one of the things that do fail, and I I wouldn't be able to tell you if 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 that aspect of them is good or bad. I don't know, but if they do have it, well, that ends up being much. That ends up being the nutritionist job. That makes the nutritionist job much easier in, in the place that they're at. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, yeah. I think we'll. I think what we'll do is I, I don't want to go over any of the old ground that we did last time. I think mm -hmm. it goes without saying, Juan. Uh, the Hodge on Nodge viewers and listeners absolutely love your contributions, man. Mm -hmm. I think what we'll probably do if you're willing is um, six months down the line, or if there's something that one of the players does that's particularly noteworthy or whatever, we'll get you back on just for a chat, man, because I'm sure mm -hmm. you'll be keeping a keen eye on on how these guys are doing. Mm -hmm. I think we we obviously mentioned about the the links and the and, and the growing connections that Norwich City have in South America. It's obviously been a key area of focus in terms of the scouting. But what I want to do is I want to flip that now, and I want to look at if South American teams, and I'm talking now across the continent, mm -hmm. uh, uh, definitely in in the countries where 
they have sellable assets. And everybody knows, like, every so often a Paraguayan potential superstar emerges, whatever. It could be any country. Um, but especially in these countries. Now, countries like Paraguay, that superstar is obviously more likely to get international recognition earlier because they need those players. Brazil mm-hmm. and Argentina, on the other hand, Uruguay you could probably put in that sphere somewhat as well. Um, there's there's going to be less opportunity for them to do that at an early stage. So upon on that basis, what I'm wondering is, if Norwich City uh, do go for these guys, there's obviously been the, the, the Buendia stuff. There's mm-hmm. there's a slight sort of, there's a bit of a pattern emerging and building. If these two guys go over to Norwich City and make a success, and even if they don't, even at that, so let, let's look at this two ways, right now and then in the future. So right now, with Norwich City putting such a, a priority and focus on this market and on trying to bring these players over, developing them and giving them a platform. Is that something that continentally, because Norwich City, Premier League team, pl- plenty of times over, over the last decade or so, and always in that sphere of either Premier League or fighting to get there, at the moment anyway. Hopefully hopefully, there's not a fall-off. Mm-hmm. Um, continentally, is that... Is that going to be something that's noticed that makes ripples? The fact that two of the one of the, the probably the promotion favourites from the championship are focusing, hyper focusing on South America as a market, and um, if not, say don't bring any more players in. If it's if it's these three um, that we have, Hayden, Nunez, and and Sara then two-thirds of their business is going to have been focused in South America this summer. Is that going to make mm-hmm. ripples across the continent? And then then also casting an eye to the future. If these guys are successful, then what, what effect could that have eventually in terms of how Norwich City is viewed as a destination? Could there could there be a, a slight niche in the market that Norwich City could kind of corner here? Uh, yeah. Now, uh, are you saying that whether whether it's going to happen in Chile? I'm talking the the South American continent. South so American. Well, well, uh, will it be viewed by by sort of newspapers? I mean, Chile. Uh, they're obviously going to notice that Brazil. Um, Brazil's probably bigger, so it's, it's maybe going to make less of an impact that one of mm-hmm. their players has gone to Norwich City. Mm-hmm. But I'm talking continentally that yeah. one of the championship promotion favourites has hyper focused in South America with their scouting this summer and taking two prospects from that area is that going to be something that registers on a continental level it could but it also depends on how well those players do so it's dependent on that success yeah yeah. and and i think before that does happen uh, teams will start noticing within the championship hey by the way look what look what north city is doing and look at the players that they're bringing in hey maybe we should focus over there And, and and I think that'll happen first. And once that happens, then you're going to start to see um, a lot of younger South American players begin to make, I'm going to sound really not negative, but, but <laughs> maybe I'll get some criticism for this, but not, 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 you not, know, get criticism, man. Not, Our not, guys not, love not, you. not on your side, but on this side, there's a lot of young talent that I see that goes and quickly sold. And now, now, keep in mind that the economics of South American football lead to these types of decisions. Of course. Agents that are looking for the quick buck end up making these decisions. And I strongly believe that many of these young players, and this is just my opinion, whatever they want to do with their careers is what they want to do with their careers, is that they should look at the championship before they end up saying, hey, by the way, let me go to MLS. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that's a much better launch pad for your career. Than it's a MLS. much better launching pad than than, than, than Major absolutely. League Soccer because they they do tell you one thing and it ends up being another, and then they want to. Then what ends up happening is that they overprice you, <clears throat> and, and with the promise of well, you see, they didn't want you in Europe, so you got to stay here. And it happens more often than you would than you would believe, or that you you'd want to believe, because that is that is one of the things that that that. The attractive of people going to major leagues are, ah, well, it's a launching pad to Europe. No, it's not. 
Just because two, three, four players have gone doesn't mean that everyone's going to go. Just because you see a seagull doesn't mean it's summer. So let, let's let, let's let's see what 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 ends up happening in terms of that. But like I said, North City's tearing it up in, in the championship. Hey, why are they doing? Oh, these two guys that they brought in. Hey, maybe we should look. Hey, who do they have? And you start looking at certain countries. Now, am I saying for them to go to Chile? No. Because to be honest with you, there is no talent in Chile right now. Yeah, 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 exactly. But that, that's why I said on a continental level, because if you yeah. take one of probably the prospect in Chilean football right now, and then one of the, the, the many in Brazilian mm -hmm. football, I mentioned, I've mentioned various times across these two pods about the mm -hmm. new Brexit rules, the tiered leagues. Brazil mm -hmm. and Argentina are plunderable markets. And that could be a Paraguayan player that, plays for Boca Juniors or, or whatever, you know, because mm -hmm. obviously the, the big clubs in Argentina and Brazil, they're watching the continent as well. So they might bring in a prospect that, that might not be ready for the jump to Europe until he's 20. They might bring him in at 18, you know. So th the thing is, there are, and, and then again, Norwich City obviously have, they have a segment of these prospects, like a, a, a part of the market that they can, can seize upon because... All of the the very best one, if they've not been hoovered up, hoovered up by academies and the uh, and, mm -hmm. and the big leagues or the big clubs around Europe, then if they are making waves by the time they are twenty or twenty one, then they're going to be going there, or they're going to be going there via a uh, Benfica or whatever. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, so, totally. No, I get it. Yeah, that's the thing. So, but I think Norwich City they can. They, I mean, to me, it seems like they have stolen a march here mm -hmm. on other clubs. At English well, championship level. They they got probably the best player in Chilean football that's that's exportable. Yeah. As what right about now. what about Gabriel Sara? Like how how good a prospect is he now Brazil's obviously littered with, with talent. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Um but how good is Sara? Is he a potential Brazil international if he reaches no. his potential? No. 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 So what's what's his level then? But that, that, that's, that's European not, terms. But like but like you said, he it's not, you know, that's not a sin. You know, I mean, no, no, no. Like it's twenty three player squad. You know, what I mean, like, um, it's going to be hard. So, uh, with, yeah, and, and on top of the players that are ahead of him, now, of course. can he get to that? It's can he get into the conversation? Can he get into the pool for twenty twenty six? Maybe. Oh no, that's what I mean. I'm saying, yeah. can Gabriel Sara be? Potentially, if he reaches his optimum level, eventually get capped. Maybe, maybe. maybe. Look, at best what, what's might... his level in terms of European league? Then, do you think he's a Europa League player, Champions League player? Yeah, yeah, Europa yeah, League, Champions be. League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean that, that that's also just. I mean, that's just as wide as of whether he, you know, is saying he's from Brazil. You know, I mean, <laughs> Champions League means a lot of things depending on what country he ends up going to eventually. Um. As far as as far as Brazil, he just has a lot of players in front of him, you know, mm -hmm. and, and and then you don't know who else is emerging as well behind him, you know, because it, it, it's it's not something linear where, where it's well he's no, of course he's not. at this stage this is going on but then no one else is going to come behind you know and, and beat him no that's not the case you know and there's players that are younger than him that have been playing in Europe much longer than him exactly so. You know, exactly, like, but I mean, careers can go so many ways. Um, Pato, Lucas, Paquita. Like, you you can look at you can look at the journeys that players have taken, even if they go to the same club, whatever, and yeah. it can turn out so differently depending on just the individual, their circumstances, mm -hmm. all of yeah. these things. So it's, yeah. it's always very open. But I, I do think it's very very interesting that Norwich City have focused their scouting there. I don't think mm -hmm. there's any doubt that they've done it because they realise. It's a market where the, there can be a massive turnover in terms of value. Now, um, if you yeah. ask me of a, of a country where I would start pointing in oh, their direction. I wasn't going to, but that's a great question. You should be doing my job, man, <laughs> on this pod. It would be, it'd be Venezuela. Funny you should say that, because see, when you were talking about talent stagnating in the MLS, the first name I thought of was Josef Martinez. Because he's been banging, in, and I know he's spelling Italy, but banging goals in for Atalanta. You thought mm -hmm. Atalanta, and? Atlanta, um, Atlanta. I thought, 
I uh, Atlanta. Um, I went to Atlanta. <laughs> like, as if he's still playing in Italy. Um, yeah, but I always thought he was one that was primed to, to have another crack at it. You know, um, he's comfortable. He's a comfortable player. Is he one of the salary exceptions? Yes, he is. Yes. 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 Ah, right. That does he deserve it? Yes, he lot. does. Yeah, he does. Based on his goal return, absolutely. Yeah, but that that type of player ends up being very comfortable. Yeah. A life, yeah, lifestyle what, what, as well, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Lifestyle as well. Mm-hmm. Look, it, it, it's great that you say that because when you hear a lot of players that play and have played in the United States, they, hey, look, I love it. I, I, I live a great life, which you can live a great life here, especially with the salaries that they're earning. But nobody bothers me. When when yeah, when you exactly. when you see, uh, I think the only player that if he goes out in public, is bothered in the United States is Leo Messi. Yeah. Okay, but that's again, there's only one. But b- players from from different teams aren't truly bothered by the fans here. They aren't rushed and they're looking for their autographs on a consistent basis and that being... is a that is a thing probably unique to yeah football either in the US. either many don't know who they are which mm-hmm. that's that's true too or many just don't bother them and if they do it's maybe one fan with their you know a fan that comes with their kid if that and after the match players do go and they sign autographs win lose or draw fans mm-hmm. you know Norwich loses 5 6 nil. You think the fans are going to go and say, Hey, can I get your autograph, Timo Pupi? Right no, 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 it's not gonna happen. <laughs> it happens yeah. here. You you play with it. We well, play with very That's little weird, pressure. Man. You play with That's very strange. little pressure. Strange, it, strange it, football culture. I love to see football growing in the US, but yeah, there are so many aspects of it that it still feels very, very kind of tourist attraction, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Not to be unfair to the game because I love to see it growing, as I say. But yeah, of course. Yeah, it does. It does feel like oh yeah, like let's go to the ball game rather than let's expect Orlando City to get a win or whatever. Yeah, you know? yeah, you know, it's, it's like you go and, and 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 you go before the match and and you're you're tying up the the banners and you're doing this and you're kind of you have a personal investment within the club. It's not just the ticket that you buy or the mm-hmm. season ticket package that you buy that makes you invested in a club. Now, why did I mention that with Venezuela? You have a ton of players that you can get. Give me some names, man. Well up for here. Um, one that I've really been impressed with, and he's, I think, 18, 19 years old, is Telasco Segovia. Nice. And he he's he's just tremendous. He plays over for La Guaira. Mm-hmm. He's, he, and I, I've done Libertadores. He, his team didn't last too long in Libertadores, but... I was truly impressed with him because I swear to you that if you saw him play, the last thing you would think is that he was 18, 19 years of age. You thought he was 26, 27, and, and, and Love a, players like a that. tremendous personality, a general in the midfield. Boom, boom, boom. You know, he, he, he was his, his, his head was on a swivel. He was moving the ball around quick. If he had to step in and challenge, he did it. If he, if he had to be able to to, to put up you know put his studs in your feet he'd do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean that those are you know the rustic guys are my guys you know those those are my Same type man. of guys you know going Absolutely. in and, and, and popping you in you know in the mouth once if need be. Well, one one of the things I don't like about football uh, modern football Juan is mm-hmm. that element of the the game within the game almost has been taken mm-hmm. away from it. I always yeah. thought that was an important part of of what made football football. Obviously, all for safeguarding players and not having a I mean, the the, the big what if for me is Ronaldo Nazario. Uh, mm-hmm. If he, if uh, like the Ronaldo for for for, for me, um, not Cristiano, the Ronaldo. If, OG if Ronaldo, he, yeah. OG Ronaldo. If he had not had like, and this was this was nineties calcio Italian football defenders literally trying to body slam him four and five times in one action of play. You know, like literally yeah. trying to hit him, get him his knee, his shin, wherever you could get him his thigh, 
like wherever you could get him, they would try and attack him and he would bounce off five challenges and then maybe off balance, like screw the shot wide against Cagliari or something. But the way that he just bounced his way into the box, right? I yeah. mean, is, is, is some of the most, for me, he's my, he's my favorite player. Yeah. Of oh, yeah, no, no doubt. I don't have an attachment to as a fan. James McFadden is my favorite player, but that's just because he's a Scottish legend. Then mm -hmm. Henrik Larson, and then probably Ronaldo, if I'm honest. Then Johnny mm -hmm. Housen, who played for Norwich. Um, but Ronaldo was was different. And I think if he'd been born 20 years later, I think he would be the most dominant player the game has ever seen. He'd be, he'd be bigger than Messi. Of course he would. Of course he would, because there would be none of that injury stuff. You know, that he was he, he was trying to fight. So I get the safeguard on the players, but then although one half of me gets that and gets that that might have, have given the chance of a talent like Ronaldo or Maradona before him, you mm -hmm. know, would, would have been less plagued by, by injuries caused by opponents. I would have loved to have seen that level of safeguarding, but at the same time, I'm all for the, like, impose yourself on the opponent by going in hard on them early. Like, I think yeah. that, I like that part of football. I like that intimidation factor. And the fact it's becoming a non-contact sport is one of the things that's uh, I don't really like so much. Well, yeah, that, that, that depends. That depends on the referee too, because this sometimes, is true. because sometimes it, it, with one referee it's a non-contact sport, with another one it ends up being the UFC. So <laughs> depends what it, weight it, division you're talking, man. Like that's the uh, yeah. That's well, the that, that that too, but but st I mean, <laughs> you see, you know, a harsh challenge where I mean. There's challenges that aren't even worthy of a red card. They're worthy of second degree assault, and Indeed. they end up being ah nothing happened. Well, you know, and that's why a lot of times when I've, when I've done matches, I said, well, no amputation, no foul. <laughs> Do you know what, man? I think South America. One of the good things about you mm -hmm. doing so, like obviously, a lot of your commentaries are yeah. are, are in that sphere. Um, I think that's one of the cool things about having that as a gig is you'll have a little bit more of that happens, I think, than in the major European leagues, maybe, um, now. Because it does and look... Need, if it, there's anything mad like that, it's usually a South American game. Or, or a referee getting tackled out the pitch or something like that. Yeah. It's usually South America, man. Yeah, and, and, and of course, when your broadcast partner ends up cheering more that than go... <laughs> then, then, then you know that you know then you know you have a, basically a twin soul you know it's like yeah you know yeah go you know he's like yeah that's what you're supposed to you know but in, in south america that ends up happening and, and therefore when you go into a world cup when you go into and all of a sudden you have two european teams facing off and they have a south american ref then anything goes i mean i mean if you notice those types of things those, those are things that i end up noticing especially you know ooh, you know it's like the well, you know, Germany plays Spain. Who's the referee? So and so. Oh, where's he from? Oh, yeah, he's from Uruguay. Oh man, watch out! It's going to be wow. It, it could it could become a UFC match. And then conversely, when I don't know Argentina or Colombia play against I don't know Japan, mm -hmm. and then it's some very very stuffy Spanish or Italian referee, you know, and it's like you breathe on the opponent, and it's a yeah, yeah you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know? Yeah, you're waiting. Exactly. You're, you're you're waiting. Yeah, you know, I, 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 you know, you know, I, I, I breathe, and you know, one of you know, someone spills a beer, and it's a penalty. <laughs> so that that ends up being that ends up being a major issue. But again, it, it ends up making it more interesting when when you're when you're dealing with with match commentary from different parts of the world. Absolutely, mate. One of the joys and one of the great privileges mm -hmm. of of our profession. Um, mm -hmm. For anyone, by the way, on this um, that's watching or listening to Hodge on Nodge, just before we wrap up, I wanted to say. Honour, pleasure, privilege of mine to be back on the Norwich City mic again for those two games in Scotland. To anyone that sent a nice message into me or anything like that, I'm really, really grateful for it. It was wonderful to meet so many of the fans as well during the time in Scotland and to have my team up here um, and best fans in best fans in English football and some of the best fans in world football and some of the nicest people I've ever met are Norwich City fans. So I'm really really glad to have had the chance to both in a professional sense and and just as a fan myself um to manage to integrate so i'm, I'm really really grateful for that i'm going to put you on the spot to finish juan mm -hmm. um i just wanted to get that wee message out there because you know i love my canary fan mm -hmm. um put you on the spot to finish i would like you to make three predictions about 
uh, and you can combine them between both players. Like so, you can do maybe one about both, one about Sara and one about Marcelino Nunez. Um, three predictions about what's going to happen with them at Norwich City. Obviously, uh, Nunez, we're waiting on, on a formal announcement. It has to be yeah. said, but but it looks like that's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, because in Chile, they already give it as, 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 a, as a foregone conclusion. So Yeah. Uh, if Marcelino Nunez tears it up, he's only going to last one year at Norwich. <clears throat> Thanks for that. Nice positive one. <laughs> for the Norwich fans, no, I agree with you. I think, I think, I, I can see the sense in that, or maybe eighteen months, maybe, maybe eighteen months, because then when he, if if he's if he's doing well in the Premier, let's say, and, and I, I hope that Norwich do get promoted, which Good man, we are, need you a Norwich fan by being on Hodge on Norwich. Uh, well, I hope that it it, it it makes because I mean, what I said, I had to kind of say something, you know, not so pleasing to Norwich fans and then say another one that, oh, okay, well, that's fine too. We'll take that. You know, if, if, if Marcelino <laughs> Nunez and Sada are, are the reasons why you end up getting promoted, then, you know, then, then everything's welcome. Um, this dude knows the politics, man. Yeah, of course. You have to know how, you know, you have to know how to, how to, how to swim in, in honey. You, you have to know how to do that. <laughs> um, Sada can be one of those players or Sada will be one of those players that ends up being maybe not the leading goal scorer on his team, maybe not the leading goal scorer in, in the championship, but one of the team, one of the players that could be one of the most feared in this tournament because of what he brings to the table. Oh, love that. Right. Now give us a combo prediction. And then with all that in mind and all the pieces that are around him, it could help Timo Puki once again restore himself as one of the premier goal scorers in the championship. That's what we're hoping, mate. Although it's not going well, Cardiff are. I mean, keep, we... keep in mind because a lot of it ended up being on him, and only him. Let, let, let's let's be quite honest. Over him and Emmy. Yeah. Yeah, it was Emmy's creativity and Tamir Pugge's finishing, but you're absolutely right. I think I think if the team, I kind of alluded to earlier, if the style of play is more agricultural and the team looks to play and, and skip the midfield and, and, and look for a more direct approach, that's not Tamir Pugge's game. If Marcelino Nunez is threading passes through the eye of a needle to Tamir Pugge, who has anticipated it well, made a clever run, bent it to just the right angle, and runs on clean through and goal, then that's going to be getting the best out of our fantastic fin. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think I think Nunez in particular could be. And, and, and let's let's be honest. All these moves are being made with that as a final as the end game. Without doubt. As, as being able to hey, how do how do we do to improve what we have already? And with that, well seeing how, how much better can this team be compared to previous teams because obviously the demands for that end up being much greater. Yes, absolutely that, my friend. Right, we are going to finish up there. Juan, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on again, man. Me and you could um, talk football for hours mm -hmm. quite quite happily. And you know what, man? I, I definitely think for me to you, uh, mm -hmm. at some point, if work calms down um, and all of that stuff, we should just have a chat, like not on a podcast one not for public consumption, because it'd be good to catch up, man. Um, mm -hmm. Norwich fans, I hope this brings you some pleasure. I'm probably not going to get it out for full time, just with upload times and all of that sort of stuff. As I look at my phone right now, Cardiff City are one goal to the good and one man down. So I'm hoping that that numerical advantage can help Norwich City at least grab a point. My pre-match predic prediction was 1-1 prior to the game. Um, but Norwich City are going to need an equaliser if they're going to make that a reality. And to be honest, it's uh, seven combined shots on target in the 80th minute of the game. So it's obviously been an exciting day in South Wales for the Norwich City fans who have travelled many, many miles. So if you are travelling back and you're listening to this podcast, then um, I hope it brings you a bit of solace. Um, although even more than that, I hope that we get two late goals after I finish recording here. Um, for everyone who is watching and listening and supporting the podcast, I am really, really grateful. If you're listening to it in your podcast player, 
I would very much appreciate if you could give a rating on there. Um, a nice one would be better, but just let us know your opinion. And if it's a poor one, I'll see that as uh, a, a kick up the behind to try and improve things. Um, <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, I would appreciate a subscription. And if you could share these podcasts, then my idea is to, with the benefit of Juan and um, other people like him, if we, we bring in other new signings, then to give to give people a flavour of the new players that we are getting, and then once the season is is properly in gear, is my plan to get Hodge on Nodge up and running regularly again. That is the plan. But in order for that to be worthwhile, then it's up to people to 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 watch and listen. But I'm grateful for everyone who does so. Everyone who watches, shares, and messages me stuff and says nice things, then I am very very grateful for that and of course you may have seen that me and myself and michael bailey are doing the ncfc social spaces on twitter once again unfortunately just due to the demands of getting this podcast out which i've put priority on there's not going to be a post-match ncfc social today i'm sure there will be a reaction laced with plenty of hyperbole if norwich city get beat in this opening game of the season but um i promise at least at the very latest by september I will have those spaces up and running very regularly again because that's when my situation work-wise becomes a bit more flexible and malleable again. But thank you very much. As I say, if you're listening, please do subscribe and give a rating. If you're watching, then please do subscribe to my YouTube and any shares, likes, comments, always appreciated. Thank you very much, everyone. It's you guys that make this worth doing. And it's thanks to people, oh, do you know what? I've done it right every time in this podcast. Thanks to people like Juan. Um, and this time I pointed to the wall. I was, that was the third time unlucky, man. Um, no, but it's thanks to people like you, Juan, that we can um, deliver this insight. And it's the first time, actually, that I've had a get that guy back on again demand. <laughs> from, from a they, no, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I, I really do. I mean, it's, 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 it's the least I can do, but, but also especially when it's reciprocated, it ends up being all the more enjoyable. Thank you, my man. Um, if people want to find you, then where can they do that? Um, actually, I'm going to do it a little different. I I, I also, uh, I mean, I, I've been dabbling a bit, but I, I think I'm going to go more all in when it comes to my YouTube channel. It's uh, oh, nice, uh, Juan, uh, Juan, Juan G. Orango TV on, on YouTube. Is that all uh, one word? Any species, underscores, anything like that? No, I just, just look for it, and I guess you, you you'll get it. You know, I, I just recently put something up on on Argentina's new new pressure, uh, which Ooh. when it comes to Argentina and politics and with Argentina, when it comes to politics and football, they are always hand in hand. And uh, all of a sudden, with the economic situation in Argentina, uh, now there's an additional pressure for Argentina to maybe possibly have to win the World Cup. Well, that is interesting. I definitely want you to send me that Baldano article um, mm -hmm. if, if you can. And then I'm yeah. going to make a request. I'm going to tweet out this um, that, that this podcast once it's ready to go uh, yeah. with the links. See if you could give me your favorite Gabriel Sarago and your favorite Nunez. I think you put it. I think you already put it. And so actually, that, that was the right one that I picked for Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think you did that. Right, and let's and do actually, your favorite Nunez goal then. If you want, send me a link to that, and I'll ping that on there as well for people. Actually, to I'm, I, I have to, I have to look for it, and I, I might even have it on commentary. But uh, oh, did you voice uh, it? That's even I, better. I think, I think it was that one. And, and I, if if I look for it, I will. I mean, I'm not going to do it right now because I don't want it to. You know, we I don't want transfer to have... me the video file, and I will upload it. Um, as long as you're happy. I, I mean, I'm happy to do it directly and attribute mm -hmm. it as you see fit. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, just just let me know, or if you find a link online, I'll be happy to put that on there. So there will, will be, be some Nunez yeah. to enjoy for the Norwich City fans who have stuck through this podcast, which is now eight minutes into stoppage time. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like a Libertadores match. Well, yeah, um, only I'm the referee, and I would hope that I would do a better job as an arbiter than than most referee and performances I've seen in the Libertadores. But mate, you can probably make more of a, a sound judgment on whether I have done or not than I can. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Juan. Um, Thank you. Uh, so, Juan G. Arango TV. If people want to find you, they can find you on Twitter as well, I believe. Yes, Juan G. Underscore uh, Arango A R A N G O. Nice one. And same thing on Instagram. 
fantastic. Go and find Juan, follow all of his socials. He's one of the people that I love to talk to about global football because um, some parts of the world that I don't get to watch the game, it's speaking to people like Juan that helps pad out my knowledge as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially at exciting times like this when Norwich City are being quite creative in their transfer strategy. So let's not all despair if we do lose this first game. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Always good to end in a cliche. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. And on the ball, City.